London where I well, to people in London where I am. Morning to Dr. Anup Singh in Washington, and good afternoon or good evening now to all of you in Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and it's a particular privilege to welcome Dr. Anup Singh. First thing to say is Dr. Anup Singh is a long-standing, very supportive friend of Sri Lanka. I believe his first links to Sri Lanka came about when he served as the IMF representative in, in Colombo. Uh, this was many years ago. But even after he finished his term as the resident representative, he has remained engaged with Sri Lanka and has supported Sri Lanka in very many ways. And very senior policymakers in the country um, have from time to time consulted him on important issues, including um, the ways and means of navigating our relationship with the IMF. Just to say something about him as a person, he served as the director of the Asia and Pacific Department of the IMF, as well as the Western Hemisphere Department. Before that, he worked on many regions. He's worked on emerging markets. He's worked on transition economies. Uh, he's worked on you know, different geographies, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America. So he's a man of tremendous experience. And outside his life at the IMF, he has recently served on the uh, Indian Finance Commission, the 15th Finance Commission of India. And I think for today's topic uh, regarding the fiscal architecture, uh, that would, I think, be a very relevant experience uh, from which I hope he will draw upon to share some insights. Um, he, um, his, as far as his educational background is concerned, he's got degrees from the universities of Bombay, Cambridge, and LSE, and he's also been adjunct professor at Georgetown University. So that's Dr. Anup Singh and Dr. Anup Singh's uh, extremely impressive credentials. So with that, let me uh, invite Anup to uh, make his remarks. He has a PowerPoint presentation, which he will be sharing with us. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you, particularly Anna Amira from Pathfinders. Uh, you remind me about my days in Sri Lanka. I hope they are continuing. Uh, just one brief look back. I would say over my times, some of my closest friends have been and continue to be in Sri Lanka. So it's clearly a country which I regard in a very personal way. But thank you for your remarks. And uh, as you said, I did serve with India's 15th Finance Commission. And the important issue in the second half of the commission was we have the COVID crisis. So fiscal rules are going to have to be rejigged all over the world. How can India change its fiscal architecture and how to do it? Uh, we added for the 21st century after uh, the COVID um, goes away. So let me talk to you about the fiscal architecture issues and try to bring in how they apply to Sri Lanka at this time. I will try to pull up a, a PowerPoint. Uh, can you see it now? Is my PowerPoint? Uh... No, Dr. Singh, we can't, not as yet. Okay, let me just do it again. Uh, it takes a while to make the thing work. So I think I'll be able to. Yeah, okay, now we're good. That? Yeah, now it's good. Okay, so let me talk about the uh, three aspects of the fiscal architecture. Um, so these are the fiscal rules that countries have had over time. Uh, these are rules to be set across all levels of government. Uh, the issue is that in order to make these rules work, we need the public financial management systems which provide consistent reporting of the fiscal indicators that are part of the fiscal rules. But there's one more important aspect to these three pillars. And that is you generally need some kind of an independent assessment mechanism or institution that provides assurance independently of the government on the working of the other two fiscal pillars 
So why is this important now? Well, you know, uh, COVID has certainly accentuated the problem of uh, resource availability. There's been a scissor effect. Now, what is that? It means across levels of government, revenues have suffered, but the spending need has gone up and there's a need to raise the quality of public spending in countries. And as we've seen over the past 20, 30 years, these fiscal rules, these fiscal pillars of architecture generally change after a crisis. So right now, most countries in the Western world and India and Sri Lanka, they find that fiscal rules were made for a different global environment. And so the issue is how do we change them now? And therefore I think for Sri Lanka, uh, this is a good time to relook at the architecture it has inherited, relook at the architecture that I believe was approved for one or two years ago, and then set a new fiscal architecture. And generally this has debt targets on the stock of debt. It has deficit targets. And to set these in a way that makes for macroeconomic stability and market credibility. My point is that these fiscal rules need to be measured and made available and assessed with certain institutions. But the issue is that in countries like in India, where the public debt is over 90% of GDP compared to where it was a few years ago, in Sri Lanka, where I believe the government debt is now well over 100% of GDP. And if you look at the problems of liquidity that many countries are facing, such as well, all over the world, but in Sri Lanka, uh, my sense is that uh, gross reserves the gross foreign exchange reserves of the central bank are only a fraction, less than half of the debt service payments externally falling due over the next one year. So the issue is that it's not just Sri Lanka, across the world, the uh, existing framework for the fiscal rule is now needs to be reset. The old rules Sri Lanka had under the FM, FMRA adopted meant long time ago, almost the same time as it was done in India, 2003, you know, this is out of date. There is a new framework, which I believe was approved uh, one or two years ago, but that new framework has not yet been implemented. So the issue therefore is, as the government now moves correctly to, um, approve it and implement it, what is most important is, just, is not just to have the, the right institutions, but the issue with your policies must be seen by the markets and by the world as being consistent with the targets you set in the rule. For example, if you say our debt target over the next five years or 10 years is 50% of GDP, I believe this was the intention in Sri Lanka uh, a few years ago. In India, the target was 60% of GDP for the center of the states. Okay, that sounds good. The issue is more, are your policies consistent with those targets? And more importantly, not just are they consistent, are they viewed by markets as consistent? Now, the next point is what I mentioned about the public financial management, then any new fiscal rule needs to be supported by the framework of public financial management. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And the third pillar I mentioned earlier is, you know, we all need an independent institution called the Fiscal Council that most or many countries now have. So the issue is, the whole architecture has three pillars. It has rules, it has a framework to measure the rules and a mechanism to monitor it. And finally, most importantly, the policies must be consistent. Now, very briefly, what are the institutional reforms 
that any country needs and that Sri Lanka needs. It needs specific institutional reforms. These reforms, I won't go into details, but you know, Sri Lanka has tried to develop a medium term fiscal framework. This has been proposed, it needs to be implemented. I believe Sri Lanka has been working towards having a public financial management law. What this is, an overarching legislative statutory act that governs how fiscal rules are measured. You don't want a situation where you say your fiscal deficit target is 3% of GDP. And very briefly, I think India had this problem a few years ago. It had a target of 3% of GDP. But then you see, unless you have a framework that defines what is revenue and what is spending. So you get a deficit target that's consistent with the reality. But if a government is able to say, all right, let's finance subsidies uh, by a, a state-owned enterprise and let the state-owned enterprise, the public sector unit, finance it, say food subsidy. So if it's being financed by an institution that is not formally part of the general government, its spending does not show up as a deficit until, until it runs out of money. So when that institution runs out of money from the subsidy payments is made, the government then steps in, has to bail them out. So when they transfer resources to that institution to bail it out from what it owes the banks or other financial institutions, is not shown as a current expenditure, it's shown as a transfer to a public sector unit. In some cases, it's shown as a capital expenditure. So what the issue is, you have to be sure you have a system whereby you define what is revenue, define what is spending, ensure that all enterprises, units, local governments, institutions, and state or enterprises, if their spending is going to be covered by the central government eventually, it must be part of the central government from the beginning. That's an important point India has been facing. The finance minister of India, in her budget speech, the last budget speech, made this very clear, that India has this problem and we are going to deal with it. So the recognition of the problem in India was great, and now they are dealing with it. So I'm seeing across many countries, we see this, that there is manipulation of fiscal data, and this detracts from, takes away from, using the fiscal rule, that makes sense. Now, any fiscal rule you have, you know, it has to be based on a consolidation path for the medium term. There's no point saying that your target is X for next year. The market want to know what is the medium term plan and what are the policies that will take you there. Now, crises happen, like now. So most rules have escape clauses. The current crisis was so severe that virtually no country in the world had developed escape clauses from the rule that were consistent with the COVID crisis. So we need to rebuild how we set these escape clauses. And finally, coming back to my point on the independent mechanism to report, it needs somehow, it needs oversight by parliament. It needs oversight by the independent fiscal council. These are the three pillars. Now, I believe Sri Lanka has been working on a public financial management law. We have recommended this in the 15 Finance Commission report in India. That is perhaps something which India needs to do too. Many countries that have fiscal rules have found out that unless they have an overarching legal framework, it's very difficult to define consistently over time 
to the roles and responsibilities of the key stakeholders. So I'm not sure where Sri Lanka is uh, towards developing this law. I believe the process has started. Uh, my own sense is, given the coming out of a crisis from COVID, maybe there should be a high-level expert group to look at where the current efforts are in developing such a law, re-look at it, and when there is consensus across each stakeholder for a law, it should then be submitted to Parliament. Fiscal Council. Many countries have it, many countries don't. India does not, Sri Lanka does not. The evidence from countries tells us that if you have an independent, highly regarded fiscal council, it complements the issue of the fiscal rule and there's more market credibility to having a fiscal rule if it is being assessed somewhat independently by an independent council. So countries have put together either a standalone fiscal body or an independent body under parliament, but with the powers to access whatever records it need from the government. I want to make it very clear that in setting up a fiscal council, this independent mechanism, it is only advisory. It has nothing to do, there's no conflict of interest with the enforcement of the rule. That is the prerogative of the government, the auditor and parliament. But the fiscal council is publicly assessing the compliance, which helps the process move ahead. Now, let me talk about revenues. Um, and let me be frank and give some personal comments. So I was asked to join India's uh, 15 finance commission some years back, two years ago. And uh, the issue was how to spend, what to spend on, how to devolve revenues from the center to states and the local bodies. Sri Lanka has the same issue. My early uh, reaction, which I said partly as a joke, was given where India's revenue is, India needs a revenue commission more than it needs a finance commission. I said India needs a commission that will raise its tax revenues since it is so low at the moment. There's more, unless you have the revenues, it's very difficult to spend in areas a country needs to spend on. Now, to me, it is alarming to say the least. I thought India's was among the lowest from the G20. Uh, Sri Lanka's is even lower. In some sense, I believe, Sri Lanka's tax revenue ratio has actually fallen, not gone up in recent years. Now we understand under COVID that will happen. The issue is pre-COVID, I think it had begun to go down. So if you have a revenue ratio, which is as low as 10, 11% to GDP, it is frankly impossible to meet your expenditure needs, regardless uh, of what you will spend on. So I would say that the revenue ratio as an instrument is not a formal pillar of my three pillars. But to me, it almost comes first. Now, what we found in India, uh, that India's tax ratio, 15, 16, 70% of GDP, there were a number of international studies done, including in India, including by the Finance Commission, including by the IMF. These studies showed that India has a significant tax gap. Now, what do I mean by a tax gap? 
the tax gap tries to measure what should the tax capacity be given where the country is. So in light of India's economic and social structure, where should the tax ratio be? And the common conclusion in India was that there's a tax gap of about 5% of GDP. That means given where India's structure is, its tax ratio needs to be 5% higher than the actual. My sense is that Sri Lanka is about the same. Your tax capacity should be at least 15% of GDP, which will still be low. But if there is a tax gap of 5%, that is a serious issue. We need to address that in any country to meet our needs of equalization and growth. Now, this is a process, but IMF studies have shown over time, they've looked at this for about a hundred countries over the last eight years. And they found that there are ways in which you can raise the tax ratio and meet this tax gap by about 3% of GDP over a few years, like three years. And the point is, the issue is not that you need to tax the poor. The issue is the opposite. The reason why tax ratios are low in countries is because you don't tax the rich and there are exemptions all over that take away from the tax base. Now, I know in Sri Lanka, you the VAT rate was declined a year ago or, or two years ago. It increased the tax gap. But overall, my point is that if your tax structure is made less distorted and more efficient and more streamlined, it means avoid having multiple tax rates, avoid having exemptions, because all these exemptions and these multiple tax rates, all they do is they give reason and ability for people who are rich to avoid paying tax. So the issue is you're not raising the tax ratio to hurt the poor, you're doing the opposite. And over time, you need a more progressive system because otherwise you have a system that is the opposite of equality. You're not using those who can afford to pay to meet the social needs. And if there are particular trans, if there are certain social needs, there is clear evidence that yes, countries have social needs, meet them by targeted transfers. Do not meet them by exemptions because exemptions will not be used effectively by those who need the social need. It'll be used by the rich. So I think this is a very important point. But now coming back to the fiscal architecture, if your public debt, now I know some years back, your target was in Sri Lanka to have a public debt of about 50% of GDP over the medium term. I think that's, that's fine. The issue is now the public debt is over 100% of GDP. It's even higher in some other countries, emerging markets and advanced countries, we need to develop a sustainable medium-term debt path in order to do, build up market access. The issue is, if you, unless you adopt policies to bring the public debt down over time, over five and 10 years, not in one year, five or 10 years, uh, it's going to make it impossible to meet your social needs. And frankly, your financial sector, your banks, your non-banks, they can't be recapitalized sufficiently unless you built up market financing too. So I would say that across the world, the evidence is that develop a medium-term debt path over the next five or 10 years, 
in a way that will give you a medium term debt that is consistent with your architecture. It's critical in order to raise international financing and to raise investment, to raise the quality of spending. So what I'm trying to say is countries like need to develop a medium term debt path because unless they do so, they are not able to develop inclusive growth. We need expenditure on human capital. We need more expenditure on education and health including in Sri Lanka. We need expenditure on the sectors affected by COVID. You need market finance. So in order to do all that, you need to develop a framework that tells the market and the world, this is our sustainable debt over the medium term. And countries therefore need to do this. So I would say Sri Lanka needs to reset its fiscal architecture with sustainable debt and deficit targets. But to do that, it first needs to develop a medium term debt path and the policies that underlie it. This is the first step to developing a framework that will rebuild Sri Lanka's international position as a country that has historically done more on human capital than most other emerging markets. We need to rebuild where Sri Lanka was as a country that is a global leader in many areas of social need, human capital, and inclusive growth. So that is my PowerPoint. And um, let me stop that and leave it to Indrajit to uh, thank, th thank you very much, uh, Anup. That, that, that was really excellent. Uh, I think uh, that was extremely clear and very concise and some very key messages. I think we need to remind ourselves that the government's fiscal operations have been the main source of instability in, in the system for decades now. I, mean, I think people are probably sick of hearing me saying this, but this is something I keep bleating on about. That is the problem. That is the underlying problem. It's the underlying problem behind the uh, balance of payments. Uh, even the dollar illiquidity can eventually be traced back to it uh, through a chain of events. So I think your key message was that we need to have uh, rules and an institutional architecture embedded in law that actually ties our hands because we are not capable of behaving well without our hands being tied. Most countries, not only most countries. Most not only Sri Lanka, probably most countries, yes. But certainly in our case, perhaps more than many. Um, so that, that was a key takeaway for me and it was presented very lucidly and clearly. Um, and I think going forward, I mean, I think just to now to throw a question at you, we, we do have a bit of a, institutional architecture in the sense that we have parliamentary oversight committees. You know, we have the Committee on Public Enterprises, we have the Committee on Public Finance, but these are parliamentary committees where often the level of expertise, you don't have specialists in those committees and they're not backed by specialist teams. And of course, the government has a majority on these committees. So in terms of independent oversight, there are some challenges. So what you're saying is you have a separate entity altogether, a fiscal council, which essentially does analysis and tracks compliance without really having any enforcement authority, but it makes information available to parliament and the public as to how the government's fiscal operations are proceeding. Is that, is that, have I got that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So now let me just ask one or two questions. Uh, you know, given where we are where we are at the moment in Sri Lanka, we have a budget deficit of about over 10%. Uh, we're having a budget coming up, you know, within a matter of weeks, budget speech. Um, and we are just I think beginning to come out of the pandemic, uh, 
the vaccination program is going very well. And hopefully, um, you know, in the coming months, we can see uh, a fairly uh, strong recovery. And clearly, one doesn't want to present a budget that would stifle the recovery in a fundamental way. So in terms of the pace and timing of the fiscal consolidation, from where we are, are there any insights that you would like to share with us? I think the point you raise are very important. Uh, markets fully understand that in these still COVID times, we need more spending. This is understood. I don't think there have been any significant reclassification of countries uh, for their spending related to COVID. The issue is where were countries before COVID and where will a country be 10 years from now? So I think we need, a, we need to develop a program. First, it has international support because you will need that to get your debt process going. Second, the focus is on meeting social needs over the next one or two years and beyond. The third is, this is a program for growth of Sri Lanka, most importantly. And finally, steps are needed to finance this domestically. So I'm saying it all comes together. I'm not saying Sri Lanka needs a crisis program. No, it needs a program that is going to target where Sri Lanka will be five and 10 years from now a global leader in where it has been over the last 50 years. To do that, you need to work on your debt, work on your tax ratios, work on revenues, understanding that all these things you're doing are not going to hurt those who need more support. And finally, I'll make one point. You know, um, going back to my times in Sri Lanka and where it is now, there are more people in Sri Lanka, in the government right now, and otherwise, like yourself, who know much more about these, these issues than I do. Institutions around the world, including the IMF, have had leaders who have come from Sri Lanka. So we don't need to tell Sri Lanka what to do. You have people who know exactly what to do. The point is the time has come to use this support and do it. And it's not a crisis program. It's a program for growth over the medium term. Thank you. Now, in terms of, uh, you spoke about, uh, more than once about the need for international support behind uh, a credible and consistent uh, medium term fiscal program, fiscal framework. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that it is, well, let, let me ask you, what is what do you mean by international support? Because to my way of understanding, the IMF tends to be the gatekeeper as far as international support is concerned. International support from other multilateral institutions as far as budgetary balance payment support is concerned, bilateral um, donors, even uh, so, some bilateral donors, and also the markets. So um, if, if you mean and I, that the IMF should be involved in endorsing this program, there is a perception that certainly the IMF of old would be interested in compressing domestic absorption um, in a way that may stifle growth. But uh, am I right in assuming that the IMF has also evolved this is not the IMF of the Washington consensus days. It is a much more flexible organization. In fact, personally, when I was in the central bank, I, I saw that firsthand, uh, how much more flexible the IMF is. But perhaps you can maybe talk a little bit more about the evolving role of the IMF uh, and, um, and how it can play a role at this point. Thanks. You raised a number of points. I'll go to them one by one. Firstly, uh, what is the international financial architecture? that the world has. Let's go back to the Asian crisis. Let's go back to ASEAN plus three. Let's go back to the Chiang Mai initiative, which was set up to make sure that when crises happen, the ASEAN plus three East Asian countries can develop their own uh, surveillance and financing. 
after several years of thought, the framework that was put together, which remains even now, is that if countries in East Asia need support, either market-wise or financially, yes, the Chiang Mai initiative will give you some support for some time. But beyond a threshold point, they will not do it for their own members without IMF support. It's not that the IMF is a great institution. The issue is you need a referee internationally. Today we have the IMF with the World Bank trying to help. So if today you need a referee, there is this one. There are many swaps that countries have built up. Many of these swaps specify that beyond the first phase, you need international support, such as an IMF program. Now, coming back to where the, the world is, you will have seen in the last five years, under the recent managing directors of the IMF, that the emphasis on social need, social stability, has been elevated. We, the IMF has recognized that any program needs to be inclusive in nature. But inclusive and means the first step is to make sure social needs are met. Unless you do that domestically, unless there is consensus domestically, the program is not going to work. So I would say that the program that any country could put together now, it's first, what is are going to be our needs on the social side? Let's build them in. Then let's go to what are the financing that is needed. We may need a couple of years to build up our tax ratio. Yes, okay. Until then, that's precisely why an international referee will arrange uh, market support and will arrange some kind of a safety net to finance us until you reach that point. So we're looking at a process that is not dealing with a debt crisis. We're dealing with a a, a strategy that rebuilds growth in a sustainable and inclusive way. That is what I think needs to be done. Thank you. Now, if I can just, again, um, in your presentation, um, you spoke about the importance of having a, a credible fiscal framework uh, so that one can have market access. Uh, so that raises a question for Sri Lanka as a middle-income country. How important is it to raise its rating and have market access? Because I think there is a, a feeling that you know we've we are overexposed to markets through our ISBs, etc. But then you know if you substitute ISBs with short-term swaps and other types of lending, which are in terms of tenor and cost, may not be as as um, attractive, uh, that doesn't get us very far. But my, my understanding was as far as mi middle income countries are concerned, um, that because many of them have a lack of, they don't have sufficient savings. So they have to access foreign savings. And once you don't have access to concessional money uh, from the, the, from the in, in the form of ODA, you have markets that you have to turn to. And you borrow, but you make sure that you borrow in such a way that you can roll over your capital and service your interest. You service your interest and you borrow. And in the process, you improve your macroeconomic fundamentals along the way so that the terms on which you're able to borrow get better and better. Your rating goes up, the terms on which you borrow get better and better. And that is how you are able to access uh, foreign savings through international capital markets in a sustainable way. All of the way along, you service your uh, interest, you improve the terms and reduce the capital requirement as well. Ideally, you run primary surpluses in your budget and reduce the borrowing requirement as well. And hopefully, increase the capacity to service debt through FDI exports, et cetera, non-rating flows. So there's a kind of a package you have to get together. Now, but what I'm trying to say is that you have to have a strategy to do that as well. 
Am I right? Side by side with your medium term fiscal framework, a strategy as to as a middle income country, we probably have no option but to deal with rating agencies and capital markets. Do you need to have a strategy to get us from where we are now to a position where our rating goes up and we have access to capital markets? This is absolutely right. I think what you said is we need policies that are demonstrably consistent with the fiscal architecture, including market access. When I say market access, the issue is not we borrowed too much in the past, so let's do it again. That is not the point, of course. When I say market access, I mean build up external financing, preferably foreign direct investment and not short-term debt. The nature of market access is very important. What countries need is not more short-term financing, certainly not Sri Lanka, not India. What is needed is more investment. You need investment for your fiscal framework. Until your domestic corporates have raised, reached a point that they have the ability and the financial status to do the investment, you will need external investment. I'm not talking about borrowing. I'm not even talking about portfolio. I'm talking about trying to build a framework that attracts foreign direct investment. For example, the world has these pension funds. We don't, we don't always recall that these pension funds the world has have huge resources and they come into you for the longer term. The issue is you need a framework that attracts external financing in a way that does not build up your debt in the short term. It's foreign direct investment, supportive of domestic private investment. So I agree with what you said. It's a framework we need to deal with the policies as well as the numbers in the architecture. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I see, Amira, there are half a dozen people who want to ask questions. Why don't you take over now, please? I think you're muted, Amira. Thank you, Dr. Tom. I'm going to, I'm going to pose these questions to the both of you. Um, Starting with one on uh, the question, uh, why did the Enforcement of Fiscal Responsibilities Act fail? Why is it made so easy to pass supplementary votes and additional debt limit enhancements, irrespective of FRA and asset liability law commitments? Harup, do you want to have a go? Well, very briefly, without knowing all the details, fiscal rules fail because you don't have institutions that define what they are and how they are to be publicly measured and assessed. That's why you need three pillars, not one. I think well, from my side, one of the reasons I think is that now this is being wise after the event, probably the targets were a bit too ambitious. So we missed the early targets and then you know, the, the will to stick with it just disappeared. That's one. The second reason is that while it's impossible to separate politics from economics, I mean, that's naive to think that you can, but probably in our context, politics trumps economics and sound financial management every time. Every time, you know, it's, it's political experience that will drive the thing, particularly as we get closer to the uh, end of the electoral cycle. Now, I, I mean, uh, it, this happens every time. You look at it every time. We, we have 16 IMF programs. We start off by doing quite well. And as the election comes, everything kind of fades away and we don't even complete the program in most instances. And I, I, the late Mangala Samarvira, in my view, having worked very closely with him, was an excellent finance minister. And in fact, um, since 1954, there have been only three years where we've had a primary surplus and he achieved two of them in 2017 and 2018. But even he in 2019, in the election year, couldn't hold the line. You know, it, 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 all, it all went backwards. So we have to, and, and this is something that has to come from the population at large. 
the population at large has to say, look, you know, we have to live within our means. We have to have people in parliament who understand that. Uh, and, you know, I think it ha having done those three and a half years in the central bank, I realized the only way change will come is if it comes from down below. If people have a greater awareness about fiscal responsibility and, and, and they want uh, their representatives to take that into account and to mainstream that. Let me make one comment on that, in Virginia. Sure, please. The link between economics and politics, of course, has become more important over the years. My simple uh, reaction is this. Uh, when policies fail, especially if the fiscal framework doesn't work and it fails, it's partly because of spending. If you don't have market access, you generally have one result, and that's the inflation. I think inflation is recognized by the politicians as the worst thing from a political point of view. Once you have inflation, it is directly contrary to your political stability. I, I think also, I know what we need to do, and people who have been uh, uh, bureaucrats in government probably have failed in this, in, particularly myself, that we need to help politicians and the public understand the link between inflation and weak fiscal policy. People don't often understand, you know, how that inflation has come about, that it comes from actually indiscipline in the government's uh, fiscal operations. Sometimes, I mean, obviously there are exogenous factors that can come in, but often it is the government's uh, fiscal operations. Absolutely. Okay. Second question is, as Sri Lanka is at a stage where it's completely dependent on the IMF at this juncture, what conditions are we to expect as a government? Conditions that will come up with the loan? I think that's for the former director of the Asia and Pacific Department. <laughs> well, I don't think any country is completely dependent on the IMF. It's a question of your policy framework. And uh, if a country turns to the IMF, it's, it's because it needs an international referee. It's like having an external fiscal council. So I guess if you have an external fiscal council that tells the world things are fine, you get market access. But I think in today's world, the IMF wants the country to take the lead and emphasize and enunciate what its program is going to be about is not going to be just about debt. It's going to be building a program for inclusive growth over the medium term. That is what we should emphasize. That should be the heart of the program. What then happens in terms of cleaning up debt is a means towards that end. So I would not, re I would not overbuild that aspect of it. Okay. Can accruals accounting and state institutions without an aggregate free cash flows over three years be included in the consolidated national budget on a compulsory basis? What, what, what was that? A, yeah. Can, can you repeat that, Amira? Yeah. Yeah. Can accruals accounting and state institutions without an aggregate free cash laws over three years be included in the consolidated national budget on a compulsory basis? Uh, a quick answer is the issue of accounting standards is very important. Obviously, accrual accounting has certain obvious advantages, but when you are developing, if you're developing a law on public financial management, it will look precisely at this issue. It will look at where the country is now. It will recognize you can't move to unify the cruel accounting immediately. There's a transition. What will your policy be in that transition? And that's why I think a discussion on all the issues that should be part of a PFM law is very important. Even if you don't have a law, you have a framework that will address all the issues that would have come under a law. 
That's why a high-level group that looks at all the components of a possible law is useful, after which you can decide, yes, a law will be good, but we don't need a law. We're going to deal with every aspect of it differently. And this is how. So one way or another, we have to go through this process. An important component of that process is the accounting standard. All right. Um, we still have about another five minutes. So if there's anybody else who has any questions, please feel free to pose those questions. In the meantime, one last question from me to the both of you. Given the given what we have been discussing in our last couple of webinars about the situation of the economy of Sri Lanka, based on our discussion about going to the IMF last week with Dr. Nadi Mulhak, and in today's very insightful presentation, and as two very experienced um, professionals and experts who not only uh, know the subject, but know the country, taking everything that we know at the moment, what are the top three things the both of you think Sri Lanka needs to do ASAP? You want to go ahead, Anup, I'll follow you. All right. I think any country in this situation, after a crisis, need to develop a framework that will ensure its crucial social needs are going to be met consistently over the medium term. That is the objective. The means to that end, we can talk about. But we must be clear, we have to build an inclusive framework that meets social needs and inspires growth in the country. That is the most important point. But I'm, I, yeah, I, I think I would totally endorse that. I think the immediate priority would be to look after those who have been most adversely affected by the pandemic. I think that whether it is MSMEs, whether it is women who have been particularly affected, whether it's been children in education, I think those are three particular areas that come to my mind as being uh, uh, of, of high priority and what we need to find ways of doing that. And, and then the other thing is, as, as Anup pointed out very clearly, is to establish a medium term framework. It's not something we can do straight away, but establish a medium term framework whereby we can stabilize the economy. Right? That we come, as he says, to a revenue uh, position of 15% of GDP and a deficit of 4 or 5% of GDP, where we have a monetary policy uh, which um, is, is, is autonomous in the sense that it is driven by data uh, and that it is proactive and, and it is removed from fiscal forbearance. Um, of course, what the central bank has done to date was entirely necessary. It, there was no fiscal space. The central bank had to come in and support the economy. It had to support lives and livelihoods, all good. But as the economy recovers, now the central bank, I think, has to go back to what I would call a more orthodox monetary policy. The alternate monetary policy was perfectly legitimate, perfectly right. But the time is coming as the output gap closes and the economy comes back to normalcy where the normal laws of economics would apply. And if one is not, if there is too much fiscal forbearance, we will again get into trouble in terms of you know, pressure on inflation, pressure on the balance of payments and through that the currency. So that cycle, that repeating cycle we have will play itself, play, play out again. So that's it. And the third thing is I think we need to work on, as Anup said, getting FDI and exports going as fast as we can. I mean, the longer term, there's education, training, skills, all that, you know, we need to, we need to get that uh, into place to be competitive in the 21st century going forward. Uh, but those are some of the areas. We have one last question. Will there be a stage where the economy could crash if we don't implement anything that we discussed today? And how long can we survive like this? A particular time frame. Well, you see, it's a question of what you mean by crash. Um, 
the issue is you want to do two things. You want to avoid inflation and you want to have policy that meets social needs. And in this pandemic, we will soon find out that spending on nutrition, education and health at the primary level has probably fallen. It is a crisis if that happens. That is a crisis that I mean. We need a framework to avoid inflation and to meet these needs, especially at the human capital level. That is the most important. I, I think that's, that's to supplement what Anup was saying. Uh, in the immediate term, if we're thinking of the next 12, 18 months, um, while things like roads, particularly rural roads, water supply, irrigation, et cetera, are extremely important. They're important in terms of having uh, good quality, inclusive growth um, and strengthening the growth framework of the, eco uh, the economy in a very balanced way. But given the fact that resources are limited, maybe right now we can rephase some of that, that very desirable infrastructure expenditure and focus on the areas that Anup has identified, maybe in the next 12, 18 months, so that we can help people get back on their feet and then go back to it. So I think there may have to be a bit of reprioritization and expenditure switching uh, to, to you know, follow the path that uh, Anup has recommended. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Swami. And on behalf of Pathfinder, uh, Dr. Anup Singh, thank you so very much for accepting our invitation, for giving us such a, uh, I think like Dr. Kumar Swami said, very concise and insightful and educational presentation. Um, it was a, a very good explanation of, uh, of what's happening at the moment. And I think for those of you who in the audience who have followed Pathfinder in the last couple of weeks, you would have noticed that uh, our last uh, webinar, two or three webinar discussions have focused on the economy of Sri Lanka. And what we have tried to do through this series of discussions is to contribute um, to the discourse on, on, on really looking at where Sri Lanka is at the moment and what are the options like I think every one of us knows the increasingly limited options that are available to the country. So we are trying to add to that discourse to share information, to make the public aware, and hopefully the policymakers aware and more um, knowledgeable of, of, of the situation and possible options that they have. Um, for the, the entire series that we have had so far is available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. And if you've missed any of the discussions, uh, go visit them. Uh, they are very insightful, very full of information. Um, we will continue this series hopefully in the next couple of weeks as well. And we welcome your feedback, your suggestions. Please feel free to engage with us. Uh, you can do so through email or through um, any one of our social media platforms. Um, once again, Dr. Kumar Swami, thank you very much. Uh, and Ms. Dr. Singh, thank you once again. Um, and to our audience, thank you for following us. Thank you for always being engaged. And we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Anup. And thank you, Amira. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you, you to everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.